is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Sabriel. Sabriel? Sabriel. By Garth Nix. Prologue and chapters one and two. In these chapters, I am introduced to a strange new world that I am still getting a grip on. And apparently there's like a magic border where people like, ah, there's a lot to take in here. I'm going to need y'all's help. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Many, many thanks for Abby for commissioning this episode. This is a book that I feel like I have heard the name of a lot, but really I remember Garth Nix's name more than I remember the name of the book. Um, it is, it really like drops you into the middle of the situation. And I believe it'll take me another several chapters before I feel like I'm really comfortable with the world that we're in here because the rules are super different than a lot of the other stuff that I have read. Um, we have, the, you know, when you do fantasy, there's all kinds of different ways that you can approach it. You can have fan- like, uh, what do they call urban fantasy that is set in our world, but there is still magic, like something like Dresden Files or, um, or what's the one with the Iron Druid? Then you can have, you know, magic that's going on in like a, uh, high fantasy sort of way where you're in a basically medieval setting or you could have a parallel world to ours that you can like walk into and there's magic so it's like kind of like separate from our world but linked to it in a way and this is an interesting combo of um having a lot of like medieval vibe in terms of the accoutrement that the magicians need to use in order to do whatever it is they're trying to do set in a world that still has cabs and buses and light switches. And is just really like familiar in a lot of ways. So, and it's especially jarring considering the way the book starts out with the prologue. I really had a sense from that prologue of what this world was going to be like And it turns out I got that sense because that's what the world on that side of the wall is like, apparently, Um, as far as I can guess. This is all, you know, my assumption from where I am in the book so far. Uh, I want to mention, because Abby is here in the chat right now. Um, Abby, I have been sort of estimating about what 50 pages is, because for some reason, not all Kindle books are labeled the same way. And this one does not have any page numbers or anything in the, uh, in the, what do they call it? Table of contents. So I basically just like figured out how many pages are in the print book and divided the like, you know how Kindle will be like, you're on page 420, even though you've only read like two chapters and you're like, I'm sure that was not 420 pages that I just read in 45 minutes. Well, this book says that it has like a total of like, you know, 15,000 pages or something. So I did some math and the prologue plus the first two chapters is about 46 pages, according to the way I divided it up. Um, So I'm hoping that I'm mostly accurate, but Abby, if you ever feel like you have a specific spot, you want me to stop when, if you commission another one of these, just like specifically tell me which chapters you want me to read. Um, Otherwise I'll just do it the way I've been doing it and sort of estimate and hopefully that'll be fine too. So whatever you want to do. Um, but yeah, so, okay, we're going to start off with this prologue because this is the one that gave me the real false impression. I feel like on purpose, I feel like the writer's doing this on purpose of what this world is like. Um, it, it, so, all right, it starts off. It was a little more than three miles from the wall into the old kingdom, but that was enough. Noonday sunshine could be seen on the other side of the wall in Anselstier. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. And not a cloud in sight. Here, there was a clouded sunset, and a steady rain had just begun to fall, coming faster than the tents could be raised. So it was a little more than three miles from the wall into the old kingdom. 
So, all right, the old kingdom is where later on Sabriel is trying to get back into because she thinks that's where her father is, if he's still alive, and also where magic is strongest. Um, but this doesn't, like, the way that this is phrased, like, I'm thinking that they're above the wall into Old Kingdom. But this says, or that they're above, so I'm picturing Old Kingdom being at the north. And I'm realizing, I think actually there was a map. Um, but I thought that they were on the north side of that wall. And I might be wrong about that, actually. Um, Abby says, according to the author, it's Ansel Stier. Uh Okay, cool. And they're on the north side. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so I'm going back to the beginning here. Table of contents map. Here we go. Yes, but it's so small on the... That's why I didn't even notice it. All right, so Ansel Stier is south. Um, noonday sunshine could be seen on the other side of the wall in Ansel Stier. So they are in Old King. Okay, cool, cool, cool. The way that was phrased, like looking back is a little bit confusing to me, but I got it. Um, so we have a midwife, she's wearing a cloak, you know, the whole way that this is worded and what they're wearing and the fact that they're intense and like out in the world feels like we're talking about a nomadic group of people in like a medieval setting, uh, vaguely medieval. It could be any period, but that's always the vibe that you get first when people are, you know, using fire to cook and whatever. Um, and this, this midwife is standing over a woman who just gave birth and it did not go well. The woman died and it appears that the baby also died really suddenly. Like it, it just as the midwife was picking her up, she like shuddered and then went still. And this guy steps out and he has really pale skin, like white, like vampire skin. I am called Abhorson, he said, and his words sent ripples through the people around him as if he had cast a large and weighty stone into a pool of stagnant water. And there will be a baptism tonight. So he says that even though it seems like the baby's dead, the baby is not dead. Um... And he sends everybody away except for the one that is going to be, except for the midwife and the one that is going to be doing the baptism. Now, the fact that they do baptism is really interesting. And I'm not exactly sure. Like, it seems like this baptism is on behalf of the charter. Um, and I have not gotten a clear picture of what the charter is, except that it is some sort of organization in charge of magic. And that they seem to have like, they're sort of like a uh, white council in Dresden Files that sort of keeps track of what kind of magic you're really allowed to do and what is off limits. Um, and there is such a thing as like, you know, char uh, charter approved magic and not. Um, and from what we find out later, Abhorson, who is a necromancer, he is like one of the only like charter member necromancers because normally they work with like trying to uh bring things back to life that should not be and controlling them and that is not his bag he likes to settle things down and sort of give them peace as best he can so uh that's probably why he was given an exception um so abhorson held up a pallid hand and interrupted let us see what the charter wills. The man looked at the child again and sighed. Then he took a small bottle from his pouch and held it aloft, crying out in a chant that was the beginning of a charter, the, uh, one that listed all things that lived or grew or once lived or would live again, and the bonds that held them all together. As he spoke, a light came to the bottle, pulsing with the rhythm of the chant. Then the chanter was silent. He touched the bottle to the earth then to the sign of wood ash on his forehead, and then upended it over the child. A great flash lit the surrounding woods as the glowing liquid splashed over the child's head, and the priest cried, By the charter that binds all things, we name thee. 
Normally, the parents of the child would then speak the name. Here, only Abhorson spoke, and he said, Sabriel. As he uttered the word, the wood ash disappeared from the priest's forehead and slowly formed on the child's. The charter had accepted the baptism. But, but she is dead, exclaimed the charter mage, gingerly touching his forehead to make sure the ash was truly gone. He got no answer, for the midwife was staring across the fire at Abhorson, and Abhorson was staring at nothing. His eyes reflected the dancing flames, but did not see them. Slowly, a chill mist began to rise from his body, spreading towards the man and midwife, who scuttled to the other side of the fire, wanting to get away, but now too afraid to run. So, I get a better picture later, once Sabriel does this same sort of thing, of what exactly is going on here. But it there's a break here. Where after they said too afraid to run, there's a break, and then he could hear the child crying, which was good. If he if she had gone beyond the first gateway, he could not bring her back without more stringent preparations and a subsequent dilution of her spirit. So I get the impression that is later confirmed that this is a whole other thing that's happening. Um, but it's a little confusing to me the first time reading it because my mind assumes baptizing a dead child, taking the time to do that, and then going to fetch her back feels like the opposite of what you want to do. You would think that you want to fetch her back and then baptize her. But I guess he wanted to make sure that the charter approved of bringing her back in the first place, like that either he was going to have their blessing. And so doing this baptism and ensuring that they like gave him the thumbs up by letting it by it working was also giving him the thumbs up to go and retrieve her or it's that he knows that she is a necromancer also already i don't know if that's born or not i don't know how that works but i guess we'll see um and it turns out like this uh you know basically death starts off as a river and he's in the river um he could feel the waters leeching his spirit, but his will was strong. So they took only the color, not the substance, um, which is a really interesting way of putting it. So he sees the baby. Um, the first gate was a veil of mist with a single dark opening where the river poured into the silence beyond. Abhorson hurried towards it and then stopped. The baby had not yet passed through, but only because something had caught her and picked her up. Standing there, looming up out of the black waters, was a shadow darker than the gate. So here's this fucking thing that is real friggin' creepy. I think he's called Caragor or something like that. Um, and it is this, like, creature that lives in the realms of death. And it's like a shadow, but at one point it laughs and he can see fire like in the in the depths of his mouth which is pretty rad um caragor yes okay i can't believe i remembered his name what are the odds of that um and caragor is apparently supposed to be like way way back beyond other gates and the fact that he's up here by this like outside the first gate he's not even like on the other side he's this side of it is really upsetting. Like, Abhorson is sort of like, mm, what's going on here, buddy? And Caragor says one of the usual calling, but unskilled. He didn't realize it would be in the nature of an exchange. Alas, his life was not sufficient for me to pass the last portal. But now you have come to help me. I, who chained you beyond the seventh gate? Yes, whispered Caragor. The irony does not, I think, escape you. But if you want the child... He made as if to throw the baby into the stream, and with that jerk, woke her. Immediately she began to cry, and her little fists reached out to gather up the shadow stuff of Caragor like the folds of a robe. 
He cried out, tried to detach her, but the tiny hands held tightly and he was forced to overuse his strength and threw her from him. She landed squalling and was instantly caught up in the flow of the river, but Abhorson lunged forward, snatching her from both the river and Caragor's grasping hands. Stepping back, he drew the silver bell one-handed and swung it so it sounded twice. The sound was curiously muffled, but true, and the clear chime hung in the air, fresh and cutting, alive. Caragor flinched at the sound and fell backwards to the darkness that was the gate. "'Some fool will soon bring me back, and then—' he cried out as the river took him under. The waters swirled and gurgled and then resumed their steady flow." All right, so let's all let's unpack all of that. This is bananas. So it there was some unskilled, I don't know if it would still be called a necromancer. I imagine it's still a necromancer that's like trying to summon Karagor for God knows what fucking dumbass reason. Ah, uh, these necromancers, I swear to God, especially when they're young and unskilled, they don't know what they're doing. They're just experimenting wildly, irresponsibly. Um so this person tried to summon him to, I would assume, the real world and evidently died in the attempt. They didn't realize how much it was going to cost to do this. Even though Karagor took their life, it was not quite enough to get him out. So he's just chilling here in this like in between waiting for somebody to assist him in manifesting in our world. Evidently, Abhorson, he says he chained him past the seventh gate. Abhorson, don't care for Caragold. Do you hear me call him Caragold? He's like butter. It's like butter. Um, Caragor and him are clearly like old enemies of some kind. And the fact that this dude is holding his child... That feels like a fucking portent, right? So he's like about to try and blackmail um, Abhorson into helping him manifest. And the baby at this point seems like it's either asleep or stunned or I'm not sure what. But when he moves, wakes her up and this baby somehow like fucks him up. And I don't know exactly how if she's like still got enough of the spark of life in her that that's what hurts him or if it's the, her defiance somehow, or if it's like her innocence, I don't know what, but this demon thing is not a fan and wants her away from him ASAP. And then Abhorson uses these bells that somehow like banish it, which is a really interesting concept. I really like that because, um, you know, that's a, that's some old mythology is that bells were used to drive away demons and things like that. And I always like seeing silly and uh, I say see, silly as in seemingly silly mythologies like that in a story in a serious way. Um, so and Horson says like that the baby's that the color had been drained from her skin. So she obviously wasn't born looking like him, but they have the same look because evidently they've both been in this, uh, in between that draws all of the color out of you, which is kind of weird. Um, the charter mark had kept her life contained when the river should have drained it. It was her life spirit that had so burned Caragor. Right. Okay. So yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so she's smiling at him and he feels like very kind of touched and excited by this. This is his child. And the baby wailed a scant second before Abhorson opened his eyes so that the midwife was already halfway around the dying fire, ready to pick her up. Frost crackled on the ground and icicles hung from Abhorson's nose. So yeah, the whole other way that like the, this scene, you know, starts off with the cold mist came rolling off him. And I was just like, why? But it turns out any time that they do this necromancy, it gets really, really cold. Um, which is interesting. I like that idea. Um, <laughs> he asks how she is, the baby. And the midwife is like, she seems good. It might be a little cold. And he sh gets the fire to shoot up. And um, he's obviously very intimidating to them. You know, they're, he's a 
freaking magician necromancer, like with real power kind of thing, who also looks super weird. Understandable. And uh, he asks this midwife if she'll come and be a nurse for him. And she understandably again hesitates. Um, and then he, when he mentions the guy, he talks to the guy. Um, I seek a man who knows a little of the charter. Uh, and the guy says, I should wish to serve for I have seen it work in you, Lord, though I am loath to leave my fellow wanderers. Perhaps you will not have to, replied Abhorson, smiling at a sudden thought. I wonder if your leader will object to two new members joining her band. For my work means I must travel, and there's no part of the kingdom that has not felt the imprint of my feet. Your work? asked the man, shivering a little, though it was no longer cold. Yes, said Abhorson. I am a necromancer, but that, but not of the common kind. Where others of the art raise the dead, I lay them back to rest, and those that will not rest I bind, or try to. I am Abhorson. He looked at the baby again and added, almost with a note of surprise, father of Sabriel. So that's the prologue. And that gives us the foundation of, like, thinking, at least, as readers, that we know what this world is that we're going to be visiting. But chapter one starts off with the rabbit had been run over minutes before. Uh, and when you say run over, you just think of a car. It could be a carriage. It could be any number of things. But you just think of a car. And a, a, a woman with her hair fashionably bobbed wore no makeup or jewelry, save for an enameled school badge pinned to her regulation navy blazer. All of this, I'm immediately like, wait, what? What's happening? Um, and so we find out that she is sixth form and prefect at Wyverly College. Wyverly. Let's say Wyverly. Um, and as we start to get more information, we find out that this college is established near to the wall that blocks off this kingdom from old kingdom. And that means that it allows you to practice magic still, that if you go further South, farther and farther away from the wall, your ability to use magic starts to completely fizzle out. And uh, magic in that area is just something that nobody even talks about because it's considered sort of like almost taboo by the time you reach those areas. So she was specifically sent to this school so that she could t continue to learn magic. But later on, when she's thinking about it, she realizes that, like, if she wants to continue her education, the only other schools are far south. So she would have to, like, find something else to study other than magic, give up her magic. And she uses magic to communicate with her father a lot. So she'd have to give that up, too, which is a bummer. It's like realizing that they're going to confiscate your cell phone and you can only use, like, the school computers and write an email, you know. Um, so this moment here, she has discovered this, uh, rabbit has been hit by a car and there is a little girl, um, at least younger than Sabriel. I'm not exactly sure how old Sabriel is supposed to be here, but I'm putting her at around 17. Um, and this girl I'm thinking is probably like 13, maybe even younger. And Sabriel uses this bit of magic to bring the rabbit that is definitely dead back to life and thinks to herself later that she definitely like broke her word to her dad that she wasn't going to do this kind of thing but she just can't help that there's this poor little girl whose pet just got killed purely accidentally and she doesn't want her to have to like go through that you know it's just really like it's a really sweet moment. She's She gives a shit. You know, it's nice. It's nice. What can I say? Especially, I have a couple of friends whose pets have died recently. And I just, you know, if I could do this for them, you think I wouldn't do that? Of course I'd do that. Um, but the little girl isn't fooled for too long. She, like, you know, Sabriel hands the bunny back and is like, he's fine, he's fine. And she's like, yeah, but he's got blood all over him. Uh... It's, it's a scratch. It's already closed up. Jacinth examined Bunny carefully, then looked up at Sabriel. 
there isn't anything under the blood. What did you... I didn't, snapped Sabriel, but perhaps you can tell me what you were doing out of bounds. Chasing Bunny, replied Jacinth, her eyes clearing as life reverted to a more normal situation. You see, no excuses, recited Sabriel. Remember what Mrs. Umbraid said at assembly on Monday? It's not an excuse, insisted Jacinth. It's a reason. Guys, can I just tell you that phrase, it's not an excuse, it's a reason, was the kind of thing that I would say all the time when I was in high school. And I would get so pissed when they would be like, you don't need, uh, like, don't use your excuses on me. Sometimes things happen for perfectly legitimate reasons. And it's not what you wanted to happen, but it doesn't make it an excuse either. And I would get so mad. Like, what are you trying to act like? I'm just like inventing something to like, what, I just did this for fun. I just ran over the fence and out here because of because I, I wanted to get in trouble. Is that what you think? So, you know, obviously at this point, Sabriel's just kind of like giving Jacinth a hard time in order to keep her from asking about the fact that she just did necromancy. But um, in those moments of when I was a student, I would just feel like it was so unjust, you know, like, how dare you imply that I'm just fucking around for the fun of it for no reason? What, what kind of logic is that? Of course, there's a reason I'm doing this. And I feel like you don't have a better alternative for what I should have done. So shut the fuck up. Ugh, got me so mad. Um, so finally, she relents and says, if you're back inside in three minutes, I will never have seen you. Um, so she runs off and she, this leaves Sabriel to think to herself about what she just did. First of all, I had wondered because, you know, when um, when her dad brings her back and he comes back and he's got literal icicles hanging off the tip of his nose, which is crazy town banana pants. I, you know, obviously his skin is cold, but he doesn't seem to have like a reaction to it. And... I think now it's because he's just done this so often and so many times that he knows like his body can handle it. But when Sabriel comes back, she has to like pretend everything is cool when she's talking to Jacinth. But as soon as Jacinth runs away, she kind of like doubles over and shakes with cold. So she's clearly not used to this. It's having an effect. Um, it was only a rabbit and Jacinth did love it so much but what would that lead to? It was no great step from bring, bringing back a rabbit to bringing back a person. Worse, it had been so easy. She had caught the spirit right at the wellspring of the river and had returned it with barely a gesture of power, patching the body with simple charter symbols as they stepped from death to life. She hadn't even needed bells or the other, other apparatus of a necromancer. Only a whistle and her will. Death and what came after death was no great mystery to Sabriel. She just wished it was. So that's interesting. Forgive me. I'm going to take a sip of tea here, everybody. I want to know. I want to know many things, of course. Um, but is this usual? Is this kind of ability and the use of it being so smooth and immediate common amongst necromancers or is she gifted is she able to do things more easily than most would be able to um because i the fact that this she was able to do it so easily could just be because it's a rabbit and not a person and maybe it's less complicated or it could be it was just barely dead it had died an instant earlier and so it didn't take much or it could be that she's just particularly good at this. And I'm not sure she wants that. But also it would be more interesting if she was like particularly good at this, you know. Um, so I'm going to just read this next section because I feel like it's a good info dump for everybody. I know people listen to these sometimes without ever having read the book. So uh, sometimes I like to give a little bit extra info in case. Or there are people who haven't read it in a long time and they forget. Um, it was Sabriel's last turn at Wiverley, the last three weeks, in fact. She had graduated already, coming first in English, equal first in music, third in mathematics, seventh in science, second in fighting arts, and fourth in etiquette. 
She had also been a runaway first in magic, but that wasn't printed on the certificate. Magic only worked in those regions of, of Ancestier close to the wall, which marked the border with the old kingdom. Farther away, it was considered to be quite beyond the pale, if it existed at all, and persons of repute did not mention it. Wiverly College was only 40 miles from the wall, had a good all-around reputation, and taught magic to those students who could obtain special permission from their parents. Sabriel's father had chosen it for that reason, when he had emerged from the old kingdom, with a five-year-old girl in tow, to seek a boarding school. He had paid in advance for that first year in old kingdom silver deniers that stood up to surreptitious touches with cold iron. I, what does that mean? That stood up to surreptitious touches with cold iron. What does that mean, guys? Is old kingdom like fairy? Because cold iron really is only supposed to do you, like be affecting fairies in, in the mythologies that I'm familiar with that stood up to surreptitious touches with cold iron. That makes it sound like somebody's just like low key prodding them with like a fork or something. Why? What does that mean? Um, oh, Abby's in the chat. Abby says, I have no idea what that means. Abby, I can't tell if you're saying that because you're trying to mess with me because you're spoiled or if you really don't. Um, oh, she says, I don't think it's a fairy thing. And having read these books like 10 times, I still haven't worked it out. Interesting. Okay. Well, if anybody's listening and they do know, and it's not a spoiler, let us know. Cause I really just like, I don't even know. Oh, wait a second. I think I figured it out. He had paid. So what it is, I think is maybe some people pay in silver. That's not actually silver like basically um leprechaun gold that vanishes in harry potter so maybe people use coins that aren't actually silver or gold and you can like get rid of the illusion by touching them with cold iron but you have to do it surreptitiously because otherwise you're implying to somebody that you think they're full of shit and trying to scam you so you have to do it like a little bit on the dl just to make sure that it's basically like using a counterfeit pen on a hundred dollar bill right i bet that's what it is okay um so that's interesting so that implies that cold iron affects magic here um or rosalie says in general does iron repel or dispel magic okay so that must be what it's like here because yeah in uh in other mythologies it only affects fairy magic but maybe that's just across the board magic here um so okay uh, understandably, um, the headmistress was very fond of Sabriel, particularly since she never seemed troubled by her father's rare visitations as most other girls would be. Once Mrs. Umbraid had asked Sabriel if she minded and had been troubled by the answer that Sabriel saw her father far more often than when he was actually there. Mrs. Umbraid didn't teach magic and didn't want to know any more about it than, uh, than the pleasant fact that some parents would pay considerable sums to have their daughters schooled in the basics of sorcery and enchantment. Um, so she doesn't realize that Sabriel like uses a book that traces the patterns of the moon to figure out exactly when her father is going to visit. Um, but yeah, Ab Abhorson's sending of himself always appeared at the dark of the moon. On these nights, Sabriel would lock herself into her study, a privilege for, of the sixth form. Previously, she'd had to sneak into the library, put the kettle on the fire, drink tea, and read a book until the characteristic wind rose up, extinguished the fire, put out the electric light, and rattled the shutters. All necessary preparations, it seemed, for her father's phosphorescent sending to appear in the spare armchair. So I love this. First of all, she gets her own study that has a fireplace in it where she can make tea and sit and read. I'm sorry. Can we just all have that? Is that asking so much? Why do we not all have a study with a fireplace where we can sit and drink tea? I just really, in the end, that's all I want. I have a version of that here. I have this little electric fake fireplace. I have my armchair. It's lovely. But do you know how much my heart and soul pines for a fireplace, guys? Do you have any idea? Oh, I don't know what it is. I really don't. Like, there's just something about a fireplace that feels like, okay, now it's complete. Now this room is officially cozy. Without that, though, 
and I've tried replacing things to try and make it that way. Doesn't work. Electric fireplace doesn't quite do it. Candles, not even close. Fireplace has to be. And not only does her dad come and hang with her, he fucking sits in an armchair with her, which I think is the most hilarious thing. He doesn't... (laughs) He could just, like, pop up in front of her on the table like a little hologram from Star Wars, but no. He settles himself down into an armchair, which I just think is so, so funny. I love it. Um, Sabriel was particularly looking forward to her father's visit that November. It would be his last because college was about to end and she wanted to discuss her future. Um, and this is when she thinks about like moving away from, um, you know, the old kingdom where she wouldn't be able to use magic. She wouldn't be able to see her dad as often, all of this stuff. However, she'd be with her friends. There'd be guys. And she's obviously interested in that. Um, And there aren't many where she is. And generally, it would just be like, you know, an adventure. So, and there's also the fact that, like, even though she doesn't really want to lose the ability to see her dad because of magic not working, she doesn't love how closely linked she is with death. So getting away from that might be a relief, which really I understand. And she's sort of just sitting there and thinking about it. And uh, she gets interrupted. And this little girl is has come in flipping out. Um, her name is Olwyn. And there is, there were, were some weird noises outside. And she opens the door. And Sabriel is thinking to herself, no one opened the outside doors in the middle of the night. Not this close to Old Kingdom. Which is really interesting. Apparently, all kinds of nasties and wee beasties are parading around the streets near Old Kingdom. I want to know what that's about. And so she, like, it's not like, oh, shit, what is it? She sprints. There's no, like, what did you do? She drops her teacup, lets it smash, and runs dead, like, sprint to the dormitory where apparently this thing is, like, shuffling around. And she feels death as soon as she comes into that room. And this is a super creepy description. An intensely dark shape stood there as if someone had cut a man-shaped figure out of the night, carefully choosing a piece devoid of stars. It had no features at all, but the head quested from side to side as if whatever senses it did possess were working in a narrow range. Curiously, it carried an absolutely mundane sack in one four-fingered hand, the rough woven cloth in stark contrast to its own surreal flesh. Sabriel's hands moved in a complicated gesture, drawing the symbols of the charter that uh, that intimated sleep, quiet, and rest. With a flourish, she indicated both sides of the dormitory and drew one of the master symbols, drawing them all together. Instantly, every girl in the room stopped screaming and slowly subsided back onto her bed. So that's pretty cool. She's uh, drawing symbols and then, like, figures out how to pull them together. Like, what a what a cool little idea. It's like she's doing uh, computer coding or something. Um, so it starts to come at her. And she decides to sort of suss it out a little bit um, and goes into the other place. And she can see that it's there. Um, It was an old kingdom denizen, vaguely humanoid, but more like an ape than a man and obviously only semi-intelligent. And she sees that there's this sort of thread coming off it that runs into the river, which means that something is controlling it. This little thread is its link to whoever has called it. So she comes back to herself and is figuring out what she's going to do with it. Um, it's not obviously malign, nor has it attempted any actual harm. Don't do anything for a moment. I'll attempt to speak with it. So she goes back in and she tries to talk to her, um, or talk to it. Um, she, or no, she doesn't try and talk. That's right. She claps. The thing flinched at the sound and stepped back, putting both hands to its ears. As it did so, it dropped the sack. Sabriel started in surprise. She hadn't noticed the sack before, possibly because she hadn't expected it to be there. 
Very few inanimate things existed in both realms, the living and the dead. She was even more surprised as the creature suddenly bent forward and plunged into the water, hands searching for the sack. It found it almost at once, but not without losing its footing. As the sack surfaced, the current forced the creature under. Sabriel breathed a sigh of relief as she saw it slide away, then gasped as its head broke the surface and it cried out, Sabriel, my messenger, take the sack! The voice was Abhorson's. That could have gone so badly wrong, guys. <laughs> like, how... I can't even imagine, if I were Abhorson, how fucking frustrated I would be trying to send her this, like, really, it turns out, crucial shit because something big is going on. And all she can do, because, of course, you can't really communicate with her the way you need to. All all she sees is this monster coming at her friends in the dorms in the middle of the night, which, of course, is really fucking shady. So you have to just hope that you're able. And, like, she goes over to the other side. But when it says, Sabriel, my messenger, it does that just as the thing, like, starts to slide away into the river. So I'm thinking maybe he couldn't talk through this thing until it started to like really get caught up in the river for whatever reason. But she manages to grab the sack before it goes under. And she is super upset when she comes back to herself in the real world. She realizes that either he's dead or he's trapped somewhere that's not in her world anymore. Um, and she's just really not in a good place. Uh, the magistrix, what, cause magistrate is, you know, somebody in a town or a County who deals in like with, uh, he's basically like a judge. Um, the magistrix, I'm wondering because of the way that it's spelled, if that's like somebody who manages the magical classes or I'm not sure, but Sabriel opens the sack and inside is a sword that's super, super familiar to her. Um, and it's Abhorson's sword. And then there is a leather bandolier, which uh, you wear across your chest. And it has a bunch of pouches hanging from it. And um, there are all of these different bells, which are apparently used in uh, all. And it's, it's really kind of cool. I re I like that idea. All, like having all these bells, the t the tools of a necromancer. Um, but there are charter marks engraved on the bell and the handle interjected the magistrix who was looking down with fascination. Necromancy is free magic, not governed by the charter. Father's was different, replied Sabriel distantly. Bl binding, not raising. He was a faithful servant of the charter. You're going to leave us, aren't you? The magistrate said suddenly as Sabriel replaced the bell and stood up, sword in one hand, bandolier in the other. I just saw it in the reflection of the bell. You were crossing the wall. That's interesting. How? How did you see that, though? What's up, magistrix? What you got? What you working with? Um, something has happened to father, but I'll find him. So I swear by the charter I bear. She touched the charter mark on her forehead, which glowed briefly, then faded so that it might never have been. The magistrix nodded and touched a hand to her own, where a glowing mark suddenly obscured all the patterns of time. What does that mean? Where a glowing mark suddenly obscured all the patterns of time? You don't just drop that into a conversation and then continue on. Obscuring all the patterns of time feels like a highly disorienting moment that should be discussed. But it's just, just mentioned here. As it faded, rustling noises and faint whimpers began to sound along both sides of the dormitory. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what that means, but Magistrix, just cool it, all right? Just be cool. Um, so that is the end of chapter one, is, uh, is so Sabriel deciding that she's going to go after her father. Um, oh my God, Rosalie just said, or it's an overly flowery way of saying face wrinkles. Oh my God, where a glowing mark suddenly obscured all the patterns of time. It's <laughs> Rosalie. That is not 
well said. You can't be talking about magic and then just say patterns of time and mean wrinkles. You can't have the, that's not, that's not clear. Did you guys get that right away? Because that would never even have occurred to me. No. Mm -mm. Don't care for it. I uh, read card for that turn of phrase. Nope. All the patterns of time. Get out of here. No, no, no. Um, all right. So we go to um, the next day where Sabriel is uh, prepping to head up to the wall. Um, the perimeter was much more successful at keeping people from Ancestier out of Old Kingdom than it was at preventing things from Old Kingdom going the other way. Anything powerful enough to cross the wall usually retained enough magic to assume the shape of a soldier, or to become invisible and simply go where it willed, regardless of barbed wire, bullets, hand grenades, and mortar bombs, which often didn't work at all, partic particularly when the wind was blowing from the north out of Old Kingdom. So that's pretty rad. This is a place that has all kind of, like, weapons that we've got. And just the wind from Old Kingdom is enough to render all of that shit completely irrelevant, which is pretty fucking humbling. And things like that make it simultaneously more understandable that there was an urge to build a wall between a, a, an area that clearly doesn't want anything to do with magic and an area that is so saturated with magic, but also makes it seem so much more futile. Like, it's just an illusion. It's like Trump's wall when there are a million other better, easier ways to get to this country. And then we're just going to pretend those don't exist and build a wall and act like that's going to do something. Like, okay. So I feel a little bit bad. There's all these soldiers that are guarding this. And I'm just like, you guys are doing nothing. Come on. Um, and Sabriel is coming out. She has a special passport that is very, very rare, as it turns out. Um, in to go into Old Kingdom if she so wants, which is, you know, being able to go back and forth is just not really common. Um, and I like that uh, the wall itself looked normal enough past the wasteland of wires and trenches, just like any other medieval remnant. It was stone and old, about 40 feet high, and crenellated. Nothing remarkable until the realization set in that it was in a perfect state of preservation. And for those with the sight, the very stones crawled with charter marks, marks in constant motion, twisting and turning, sliding and rearranging themselves under a skin of stone. The final confirmation of strangeness lay beyond the wall. It was clear and cool on the ancestier side, and the sun was shining, but Sabriel could see snow falling heavily behind the wall, and snow-heavy clouds clustered right up to the wall where they suddenly stopped as if some mighty weather knife had simply sheared through the sky. It's so wild. I really enjoy this. I don't know what that's about. I don't know how that works. I don't know if it's the wall that's responsible for keeping the weather there, or if that's like a whole other thing. Was, like, is the wall... Did that define the edge of everything? Or did they build the wall where the edge was already defined for some reason? How old is this wall? Who built this wall? Where is this wall from? What's going on? Tell me everything. Um, Sabria watched the snowfall and gave thanks for her almanac. Printed by letterpress, the type had left ridges in the thick, linen-rich paper, making the many handwritten annotations waver precariously between the lines. One spidery remark, written in a hand she knew wasn't her father's, gave the weather to be expected under the respective calendars for each country. And uh, Anselstier had autumn, likely to be cool. The old kingdom had winter, bound to be snowing, skis or snowshoes. That is very handy. She's got weather bug in a book. Pretty good. Weather bug for two totally different worlds. Even better. That's like if you had weather bug but for the moon. Even though it's not really uh, practical, be curious what's what's going on up but up there today is it snowing on the moon um so there turns out that there are some tourists that come down just to like look over the wall and it it's like super regulated one bus load a day is able to come um and 
that's because it would just be so crowded and such a logistical nightmare. And also, like, potentially dangerous, I would think, um, that there's, like, you know, a bunch of dangerous shit on the other side. Maybe some of that eats people. I don't know. Um, and these folks are just, like, there's a tight leash on them. Sometimes it's all – it gets canceled because – if the wind is coming down from the north, that that will like fuck up their buses and make them go down. Um, and that's just kind of fun. There's just, you know. Um, oh, people are mentioning Dresden and how his magic fucks with modern shit. Yeah, it's like uh, Hexus, which is, I think, the spell that he uses whenever he wants something electronic to go down. Um the authorities also made some slight allowance for the few people authorized to travel from Ancestier to the Old Kingdom. As Sabriel saw, after she had successfully negotiated the bus's steps with her backpack, cross-country skis, stocks, and sword, all threatening to go in different directions. A large sign next to the bus stop proclaimed, Perimeter Command, Northern Army Group, unauthorized egress from the Perimeter Zone is strictly forbidden. Anyone attempting to cross the Perimeter Zone will be shot without warning. Authorized travelers must report to the Perimeter Command HQ. Remember, no warning will be made. All in caps. So, this is all making Sabriel, like you know, kind of excited. She's like, oh shit, nobody's allowed to do this. I'm going to be going back to someplace I haven't been since I was five years old. This is all like just, you know, simultaneous, complete, um, a, a completely unfamiliar place that at the same time is bound to be familiar in a few places. And, uh, yet she's also feeling a sense of dread because she doesn't know what's going on with her dad. This thing, the arrow on the sign indicating where author authorized travelers should go, seemed to point in the direction of a bitumen parade ground. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Lined with white painted rocks and a number of uh, unprepossessing wooden buildings. Other than that, there were simply the beginnings of the communication trenches that sank into the ground and then zigzagged their way to the double line of trenches, blockhouses, and fortifications that confronted the wall. Sabriel studied them for a while and saw the flash of color as several soldiers hopped out of one trench and went forward to the wire. What? Okay. A trench? A communication trench? I don't understand this because when I read that, I thought that this meant like, you know, some something was because all of this so far has been like very similar to our own world, right? But these communication trenches, I figured were going to be something that like, you know, you could like send, uh, what do you call it? Morse code or I don't know, something that's like connected. But then there are people in there. They're in, they're hopped out of one trench, one trench and went forward to the wire. What is the wire? Is that where she's standing? Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm just a little bit confused by this. The communication trench. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, oh, Abby says, I think it's like a World War One reference where they still had a whole network of trenches they could move around in to stay safe. Interesting. Okay. Um, it's weird to me, though, that it's called like a communication trench rather than just like a, uh, you know, personnel trench or something. Um but and she's thinking to herself as she's watching them that it's weird that they're all expecting some really pretty medieval threats, but they have all of this modern stuff to deal with it. Then she remembered a conversation with her father and his comment that the perimeter had been designed far away in the south, where they refused to admit that this perimeter was different from any other contested border. Up until a century or so ago, there had also been a wall on the Anselstieri side, a lowish wall made of rammed earth and peat, but a successful one. Um, and she searches that out and she can see the wall. Um, she realized that was what she had taken to be loose pickets between lines of concertina wire. Um, uh, tall constructs more like the trunks of small trees stripped of every branch. They seemed familiar to her, but she couldn't place what they were. Um, so some guy comes up to her and starts to hassle her and she has her high lady face on 
I am a citizen of the old kingdom, she replied quietly, staring back into his red flushed face and piggy eyes in the manner which Miss Priante had taught her girls to instruct lesser domestic servants in etiquette for. I am returning there. Papers, demanded the soldier. Old kingdom. Sabriel gave a frosty smile and made a ritual movement with the tips of her fingers, the symbol of disclosing, of things hidden becoming seen, of unfolding. As her fingers sketched, she formed the symbol in her mind, linking it with the papers she carried in the inner pocket of her leather tunic. Finger sketched and mind-drawn symbol merged, and the papers were in her hand. It's a pretty neat trick. But this spurs all of these dudes showing up and encircling her, because she... Apparently, using magic in this area is not a wise thing. Um, Sabriel's mind and hands flashed into the sequence of symbols that would wipe clean these bonds, but her skis shifted and fell into the crook of her elbow, and she winced at the blow. Um, So, yeah, she's about to try and fight back, and then all of a sudden she's like, oh, shit, right, I'm not meant to use magic here, and kind of tries to, like, be cool for a second. Um, and this guy comes up to her, an officer who reads her passport, and uh, she has a vibe that feels very similar to her, that she feels like is sort of like Abhorsen's. Um, and it seems like he uh, knows her dad and tells her about how there was this whole thing happening here at one point with people coming back to life, creatures coming back to life, not staying dead, and causing like even more damage than they had when they were alive. And there was only so much that they could do to stop them. Like sometimes destroying their form would kill them, sometimes not. And eventually her father showed up and was able to like put some things in place that caused it all to rest. Um, And what he used were these uh, flutes, which is pretty cool. They're flutes that don't make any sound to us and they're hung all over the place. Um, and apparently make this sound that keeps them alive. I'm going to try and find this spot that, uh, he says, um, I don't know what they agreed, but I imagine it was for Abhorsen to bind the dead. And in return, he was to be granted citizenship of Ansel's chair and freedom to cross the wall. He certainly had the two passports after that. In any case, he spent the next few months carving the wind flutes you see among the wire. Oh, I wondered what they were. Wind flutes. That explains a lot. I'm glad you understand, said the colonel. I still don't. For one thing, they make no sound no matter how hard the wind blows through them. They have charter symbols on them I have never seen before he carved them, and never seen again anywhere else. But when he started placing them, one a night, the dead just gradually disappeared, and no new ones arose. Um... But the problem is that if something has happened to her dad, this magic is going to go away, which means that lots of dead things are going to start coming back again. And uh, that could be a real fucking problem because it sounds like it was absolute chaos here before her father was uh, discovered to help. Um, The flutes play a song only heard in death, replied Sabriel, continuing a binding laid down by a porson. But the bound, uh, but the bound are tied to him, and the flutes will have no power if they will have no power if a person is now among the dead. They will bind no more. So that is the end of chapter two. So I think I stopped in a good place with reading because that was a full-on hour of talking. Um, but yeah, that's interesting. So and that sucks to have like magic that's that important to keeping everything under control that's bound to a mortal because I feel like that's a real like lack of foresight on behalf of anybody else who uh is in charge of this place like if you find a guy who can do this you you want to find up find some backups right um so that you can have a sort of uh safety net i would think but i don't know actually now that i say that how mortal her father actually is The fact that she thinks he could be dead means to me that he probably is a regular mortal, but he might live a lot longer than the average person. I don't know. Um, But yeah, geez, that seems like a real, real big problem. And uh, hopefully she is able to figure out how to work some of that magic and like fix things if it does turn out that her dad is dead, because I feel like that could turn into a real problem for everybody. 
Um, anyway, so I'm going to wrap this up, but thank you very, very much to Abby for commissioning this. This is super fun to read. I have no idea what I'm in for, um, but it's a really different world. And, you know, I'm just, I'm always here for uh, stories that like have a surprising little hook that I'm not ready for. So yeah, this was super fun. Thank you, Abby, again. I hope you guys enjoyed the coverage and I will be seeing you again soon, hopefully with a new episode. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.